our God. Let us pray. Almighty God, we pray you graciously to behold this your family, for whom the Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and given into the hands of sinners and to suffer death upon the cross, who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for the reading of Scripture. A reading from the book of Isaiah. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up, and shall be very high. Just as there were many who were astonished at him, so marred was his appearance, beyond human semblance, and his form beyond that of mortals. So he shall startle many nations, Kings shall shut their mouths because of him, for that which had not been told them they shall see, and that which they had not heard they shall contemplate. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity. And as one from whom others hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him of no account. Surely, He has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases. Yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole. And by his bruises we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, We have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice, he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. The word of the Lord. Let us read responsibly in whole verse. Psalm 22, as found in your leaflet, beginning and ending with a refrain. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? My God, my God, 
Why have you forsaken me and are so far from my cry and from the words of my distress? Yet you are the Holy One, enthroned upon the praises of Israel. They cried out to you and were delivered. They trusted in you and were not put to shame. All who see me laugh me to scorn. They curl my lips, their lips, and wag their heads, saying, He trusted Yet you are he who took me out of the womb and kept me safe upon my mother's breast. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. They open wide their jaws at me, like a ravening and a roaring lion. My mouth is dried out like a potsherd. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth, and you have laid me in the dust of the grave. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them. They cast lots for my clothing. Save me from the sword, my life from the power of the dog. I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. For he does not despise nor abhor the poor in their poverty, neither does he hide his face from them. But when they cry to him, he hears them. The poor shall eat and be satisfied, and those who seek the Lord shall praise him. May your heart live forever. For kingship belongs to the Lord. He rules over the nations. My soul shall live for him. My descendants shall serve him. They shall be known as the Lord's forever. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The second reading is from the letter to the Hebrews. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts, and I will write them on their minds. He also adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, 
that is, through his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart in full assurance of faith. With our hearts sprinkled clear, clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love, to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. The word of the Lord. Our sequence hymn is number 168. congregation may be seated. The Passion of Our Lord Jesus Christ According to John Jesus went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place because Jesus met there often with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with police from the chief priests and Pharisees. And they came there with lanterns 
and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked them, Whom are you looking for? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said this to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Again, Jesus asked them, Whom are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he, so if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that had, he had spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back into its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the soldiers, their officers, and the Jewish police arrested Jesus and bound him. First they took him to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it was better to have one person die for the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter was standing outside the gate. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the woman who guarded the gate and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, You are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? Peter said, I am not. Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing around it warming themselves. Peter was also standing with them and warming himself. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Anna sent Jesus bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing warming himself. Those who were standing near the fire asked him, You are not also one of Jesus' disciples, are you? Peter denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with Jesus? Again, Peter denied it, and at that moment the cock crowed. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They, did them, they themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out and said to them, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered, If this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews replied, We are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask me this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. 
Pilate asked him, What is truth? After Pilate had said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no case against him, but you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? They shouted in reply, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a bandit. Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged, and the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to the Jews, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate said to them, Here is the man. When the chief priests and police saw Jesus, they shouted, Crucify him. Crucify him. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law he ought to die. Because he has claimed to be the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you and power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release Jesus, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. Pilate said to the Jews, Here is your king. They cried out, Away with him. Away with him. Crucify him. Pilate asked them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but the emperor. Then Pilate handed over to them to be crucified. Please stand. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It said, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write, The King of the Jews, but this man said, I am the King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots to see who, it, who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. 
Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because the Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. Though they asked Pilate to have the legs of the man crucified broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus, they saw that he was already dead. They did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified, so that you may also believe. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of the scripture says, they will look upon the one whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices and linen cloths, according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so, because it was a Jewish day of preparation and the tomb was nearby, they lead, laid Jesus there. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be always acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. The author of the Gospel of John makes it clear that Jesus was crucified the day before the Passover. For the author of the Gospel of John, the Last Supper was not a Passover meal. The Last Supper occurred earlier, and the next day after the crucifixion was the Passover that the Jewish people would celebrate according to the commandment. This is very deliberate by the Gospel writer. He is making a point that Jesus is the Passover lamb that is sacrificed. Because you see, the Friday before the Passover was, as the scripture said, the day of preparation. The day of preparation was the day you got ready to celebrate the Passover. And one of the things you did to get ready to celebrate the Passover was to bring a lamb to the temple to be sacrificed on the altar. So John is telling us that Jesus is replacing the sacrificial lamb with himself. He has other notes in there to make that point even more clear. You note that when Jesus is thirsty, they give him vinegar on a branch of hyssop. Now, Jewish people would remember that in the instructions for the Passover, they were told that after they slaughtered the lamb, they were to take the blood with a branch of hyssop and mark the door lentils and door posts with the blood using the branch of hyssop. He intentionally calls that to us so that we know that it is about the Passover, that Jesus is the sacrificial lamb for the Passover, the one who takes away all of our sins. And yes, we all are sinners. We are all in need of Christ's redemption and forgiveness. 
We can't blame his crucifixion on one group or another group. He was crucified by all of us because of our sins, because we are sinful people. Crucifixion itself was an unholy alliance of certain religious leaders and the Roman government. We ought to take note of this. That is actually usually works out poorly when the government and the church get together to decide to do stuff. When the government and the church get together to decide to do stuff, bad things happen. The Crusades bear witness to bad things that happen. When the church says, we need to recapture Jerusalem, and the government, the nobles with the armies say, great, here's our soldiers, let's go do it. The Inquisition happens when the government and the church work together. When the church says, these people are horrible, we need to get rid of them, and the government says, great, go ahead and execute them. The Holocaust, genocide, those are workings of religion and government coming together. And I will say it, do not put the Constitution of the United States, the Bill of Rights, and anything else you want in the same cover of the, unit of the Holy Bible. They do not belong under the same cover. That is not what we are. The church and the state are and should be separate. They are not to be together. The government is not an agency of the church to impose its will and the church is not an agency of the government to impose its will. We are separate entities that have our own things that we're supposed to do. And of course, both churches and governments are filled with sinful people because we are all sinful people and we all contribute to that problem. The sin is everywhere, but the church should be a check on the government's power to say, these are not good things that you should be doing. That should be the role, not to work with the government, because as the church, we bear witness to love. The love of Jesus Christ for the world, where he was willing to offer himself on the cross for our salvation. That love that we see in his action during the crucifixion, nailed to the cross in pain and dying, Jesus thinks of his mother. You heard it in the gospel reading. He says to his disciple, behold your mother, mother, behold your son. He is more concerned at this hour of his death that his mother is taken care of than he is about what's happening to himself. That is love in action. And all the horrors and the sin of the world, the antidote is love. When we act in love towards one another, to all people, when we are responding in love, then we are following Jesus Christ in his way of love. Life that is sac love that is sacrificial. Love where he, Jesus Christ, gives up his life for us so that we could have eternal life and asks us to do the same for one another. It is clear, according to the Gospel of John, that Jesus is the true Passover lamb, that his blood might save us from the save slavery of sin, just as the blood of the lambs at the original Passover saved the Jewish people from slavery. We are saved by Christ's blood today from our slavery to sin, and we receive new and eternal life through that. And in response, in gratitude for that, we stand for love in the world, reaching out in love to those around us so that the government and the church do not ever get together to do evil in the world, but stand for what is true and right and loving for all. That is the kingdom of God we strive for. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.
Please stand as we sing together hymn number 172.
We continue with the solemn collects on page 277 of the prayer book. Dear people of God, our Heavenly Father sent his Son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved, that all who believe in him might be delivered from the power of sin and death and become heirs with him of everlasting life. We pray, therefore, for people everywhere according to their needs. the world, for its unity in witness and service, for all its bishops and other ministers, and the people whom they serve. For Sally, our bishop, and all the people of this diocese, for all the Christians in this community, for those of us about to be baptized, that God will confirm his church in faith, increase it in love, and preserve it in peace. Almighty and everlasting God, by whose spirit the whole body of your faithful people is governed and sanctified, receive our supplications and prayers which we offer before you for all members of your holy church, that in their vocation and ministry they may truly and devoutly serve you through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for all nations and the peoples of the earth and for those in authority among them. For Joe, the President of the United States, for the Congress and the Supreme Court, for the members and representatives of the United Nations, for all who serve the common good, that by God's help they may seek justice and truth and live in peace and concord. Almighty God, Kindle, we pray, in every heart the true love of peace and guide us with your wisdom that those who take counsel for the nations of the earth, that, tranquili that in tranquility your dominion may increase until the earth is filled with knowledge of your love through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for all who suffer and are afflicted in body or in mind, for the hungry and the homeless, the destitute and the oppressed, for the sick, the wounded, and the crippled, for those in loneliness, fear, and anguish, for those who face temptation, doubt, and despair, for the sorrowful and bereaved, for prisoners and captives, and those in mortal danger, that God in his mercy will comfort and relieve them and grant them the knowledge of his love and stir up in his will and patience to minister to their needs. Gracious God, the comfort of all who sorrow, the strength of all who suffer, let the cry of those in misery and need come to you, that they may find your mercy present with them in all their afflictions, and give them, we pray, the strength to serve them for the sake of him who suffered for us, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for all who have not received the gospel of Christ, for those who have never heard the word of salvation, for those who have lost their faith, for those hardened by sin or indifference, for the contemptuous and the scornful, for those who are enemies of the cross of Christ and persecutors of his disciples, for those in the name of Christ have persecuted others, that God will open their hearts to the truth and lead them to faith and obedience. Merciful God, creator of all pe peoples of the earth and lover of souls, have compassion on all who do not know you as you are revealed in your Son, Jesus Christ. Let your gospel be preached with grace and power to those who have not heard it. Turn the hearts of those who resist it and bring home to your fold those who have gone astray, that there may be one flock, 
under one shepherd, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us commit ourselves to God and pray for the grace of a holy life, that with all who have departed this world and have died in the peace of Christ, and those whose faith is known to God alone, may we be accounted worthy to enter into the fullness of the joy of our Lord and receive the crown of life in the day of resurrection. O God of unchangeable power and eternal light, look favorably upon your whole church, that wonderful and sacred mystery. By the effectual working of your providence, carry out in tranquility the plan of salvation. Let the whole world see and know that things that were cast down are being raised up, and things which had grown old are being made new, and that all things are being brought to their perfection by him through whom all things were made, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. We continue with him 158. Behold the wood of the cross, whereupon hung the world's salvation. Amen. 
Behold the wood of the cross, whereupon hung the world's salvation. Behold the wood of the cross, whereon hung the world's salvation. I invite anyone who wishes to come forward for veneration of the cross. We continue with the confession of sin found on page 360. Actually, I'm sorry, I missed a hymn. Hymn number 166.
Now we continue with the confession of sin on page 360. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins to our Lord Jesus Christ. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. While the altar is being prepared, we will pass the offering plates for the Good Friday collection. This collection is given directly to the Diocese of Jerusalem in the Holy Land for their work and ministry. And they definitely need our support this year.
communion. If you wish to receive by intention, that is dipping the bread in the wine, please keep your hands folded. I will dip the bread and place it in your mouth. If you wish to receive by holding your hands like this, I will place the wafer in your mouth and please guide the chalice. I will place the wafer in your hand. Please guide the chalice to your mouth to receive the wine.
The final prayer is on page 262. Let us pray. Uh, 282. 282. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, we pray that you set your passion, cross, and death between your judgment and our souls, now and in the hour of our death. Give mercy and grace to the living, pardon and rest to the dead, and to your holy church, peace and concord, and to us sinners, everlasting life and glory. For with God, Father, and the Holy Spirit, you live and reign, one God, now and forever.